So welcome to Shader Graph Point Two. I will make a short recap what we did last time. Um, so for those of you who didn't, who weren't here the last time, to have a like quick um, starting point. So the first shader is more or less the, the thing you get when you when you go to unity and say like i want to have uh, create a shader and no sorry um that's when you're not prepared um give me give me a second <laughs> um never mind we are create um you get yeah computer this was a i was correct uh, when you go to create shader and compute shader, you get more or less your first compute shader program, which looks like uh, very uh, small. Um, and you need a little bit of code to actually visualize it. So the first shader program was more or less um, going into that, just running this shader from Unity. Um, in, that annoys me since Unity 2019 that it's so slow when when you hit play. <laughs> so basically, we have a scene, we have a we have a script attached, we have our compute shader referenced, and uh, the result goes in the render texture. So if I click on the render texture, I actually see what my compute shader did, which is maybe a little bit boring. Um, first of of the result uh, and second um, because I have to click on on a render texture. So this was more or less the, the compute shader we, we, we went through. Um, so short recap, we have a kernel which you make with a pragma um, visible to the outside world. And in this case, the kernel is called CS main. We get this um, ID, which has three coordinates, because in theory, you can also have a volume, not only a two, two or one dimensional uh, texture. Um, and since I declare a read-write texture with float fear, which gives you a RGB color, um, you can address it with the XY coordinate of the ID you get. Um, and these magic numbers here, 200, uh, 512 and 256, if I go to the code, is just the dimension of my render texture. So I get a value between zero and one. And this gives this shading uh, from red, green, yellow. So we have black on zero, zero, green on the y-axis and red on the uh, x-axis. And the combined is then for sure yellow. Um, then we got a little bit deeper into the whole stuff. Um, this is kind of a shader with time in it. And already, I have to speed up the time a little bit, I guess. So in, it just mixes a time value into the shader, so it blends over. Um, I can give it the resolution. So if I go to the script, it's a little bit more mature. So it creates a render texture. Um, it sets um, the compute shader, the resolution of the texture, and it, via the kernel, it give, um, gives the render texture to the target. So if I go to the compute shader program, I have a read write texture with the name target, which I refer here target render texture and I give I can address resolution so resolution is a variable with float four which I can yeah send a vector to and the last thing is like set the float which I give the time um, and in theory we should have seen something in the red channel that it goes from from like if I go back, you see here um, it's no longer black but um, red. So if I give it a slightly faster value, maybe we see it. So left corner is black, and with time going with time passing, it's still too too much too slow. Sorry. It's, so. Um, with time goes by, it, it goes from black to red, and then, yeah, everything is red on the bottom, and everything is yellow on the on the top. 
Um, so far, so good. Everybody has understood the principles of a compute shader. Any questions? Please raise your hands. Um, I see, where can I see the participants? Let me check. Or, okay, so then next was like, um, how can I use kind of random functions? So there's no random functionality in a shader, but you can write your own random functions. So what you get is like, you have to check, but you get like this fancy old, old school TV noise thingy going on. So this is a simple compute shader with a random function that yeah, computing on some values gives you kind of pseudo um, randomness as we will experience in the um, examples today. It's not super random, um, but it does its jobs. The last thing we stopped was like functions. So also the randomization function was already a function, but this is like how I can use um, one function to make some fancy um, stuff with, with the shaders. And if we go into that code, um, <clears throat> it also uses the time value from the, from the last um, example. And in principle, I have um, two, uh, more or less one one function, or this is a variant of the first one, um, which draws a Gaussian curve in on a like on two D. So we get this this blurry blob, um, and then I call it three times um, and make this peak, which which gives like yeah, which makes this exponential. Um, 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 fall off, which is more or less a, a Gaussian, Gaussian 2D um, sphere. And then I calculate on, on three different points, which are changing by time. And in the end, I calculate the red channel with all these three points. And that's what, what, what you see in the end. So you see more or less, not exactly three dots because I think two are in the middle and not not quite much moving. And so you see this like wobbling of these twos in the middle. <clears throat> and what you see is in in the end the sum of all threes uh, in the red channel, which gives this nice kind of plasma effect or whatever this is called. So this was in short and fast in the last um, the the first part of the Unity render. Uh, Unity shader, compute shaders. Um, what I want to start with is more or less what we lifted off. Is like I used the functions from the last thing, so nothing has changed from the compute shader, but from the scripts. First of all, we can get rid of always defining our uh, render texture. I have um, written a helper function, <clears throat> which I call GPU, which is a static class, which does a lot of stuff or has a lot of helper functionality to be used for, for compute shaders. So first I make this render texture call, which creates my render texture. Then I make the usual stuff, um, searching my uh, kernel in my compute shader, setting the resolution of the texture, setting the render texture. And then with GPU dispatch, which was in, um, yeah, come to that, which just um, um, dispatches the, the computation to the um, GPU. So this is like the difference between the two programs. So instead of having always to define my render texture and write this five line of codes, I have made this helper function. And the same goes for compute dispatch instead of I have to know how much um, um, kernel, uh, how much um, no threads I have per channel. 
um, I have this dispatch function in the GPU um, helper functions, which peaks like how many kernel, uh, how many um, threads do I have per dimension, and then divides this uh, or divides the the resolution of my texture so I have the correct numbers of of groups for each channel for all the threads inside the group. Yeah. So short recap, um, I can define a kernel with, with how many threads can be run in parallel per, per dimension. Um, as I found out on my um, hardware, it's 16 and not 32, but this will come in a later example. So, part two like let's let's last time it was only about functionality and computing something per pixel but the much more interesting part is not to compute something per pixel but having mm, something like smart agents or something like running around and do stuff so the first um example is very stupid if i hit play you just see some agents that have a position and a velocity and over time they just um, sum up the or we we how, how do you say um iterate uh, from one position to the next via their velocities and for sure this only gives a, a straight line on the on the output um if you go to the code so the compute shader function is quite easy Um, we have a kernel, which is this update the agent function. Um, I grab an agent via this the X coordinate from my shader. Uh, and then I just make a calculation um, in which direction is my agent pointing. I calculate the cosine and sine um, and add it with its speed uh, and the time to a new position. And then I write the agent back to the buffer. So it, it gets the new values updated. And then I set the color from the agent on the on the target render, on the render texture, on the given position of the agent. So for the agent, I have a struct which defines the position, an angle, a speed, and the color. And then I have this new structure, which is a, a read write uh, structured buffer, which basically is a one dimensional array of uh, struct. So you can more or less um, handle any, any, or you can give any structs to the graphics, uh, to the, yeah, to the GPU. And the rest you already are familiar with. We have a render texture where we can draw on a resolution and the time. And from the code side, we have our compute shader. Um, the resolution of, of the texture and we have to have the exact struct defined in, in C sharp. So the both must match. Otherwise, you maybe get um, mangled or wrong data on your GPU. Then we have the setup agents, which is more or less um, setting up all the values for the agents on the C sharp side, so in, in memory. And then we go as usually search our kernel, which is in that case was the update agent function. We define the render texture. Now we create a compute uh, compute buffer where we can um, set the agents to the to our compute shader and to the kernel, which is which is essential because you can have more multiple kernels. So in each kernel you want or for each kernel, you want, um, no, I have to rephrase it. Um, if the kernel wants to see the agent, like the struct, the, the, the uh, compute buffer, you have to define it and, and create this buffer for. So create buffer is a, a, a simple function, which um, gives you the compute buffer with your data and your length of the data, 
which is more or less uh, defined or with the stride of your data, which is more or less the, the if you're coming from C, uh, C sharp, uh, from C++ is size, size of, or here with the run, run time marshalling, um, you get the same, like the same functionality. You get, you get the, the size in byte length of your struct. And then you set the data to the compute buffer. And in the end, you, you connect the compute shader with the kernel to the compute buffer. You, you connect the compute buffer to the compute shader to the, to a, to the specific um, kernel. And then we are more or less ready and make our GPU dispatch um, on the compute shader and the kernel. So as you can see, we're just updating agents. We no longer operate on, on a pixel basis on the render targets, um, but we run this for all agents and then we get this like line drawing behavior. As I said, this is quite stupid and does not much. So since we are approaching um, Christmas and the end of year, um, I have some smarter agents and a firework. So basically, this is done all by the agents. I hope you see it. I can set down the resolution, maybe then it's more visible. So in principle, one agent uh, or the agents have a velocity and gravity is acting on them. And at some time they explode and generate new agents. And yeah, these behave like the other agents. They fall with gravity and have some velocity. So let's look onto that. The program is more or less the same. Um, we have uh, still our position, our angle, speed, and color. For, for the starting points, we start at the bottom, like here. Um, sorry, no. I'm, a, I'm on the wrong thing. <laughs> sorry. So, we start at the bottom line, so y, y is zero and x is something between zero and one. We have a velocity which is going up a little bit sidewards and upwards, and we have a random color. And this is like, I'm running through all the agents, but only every, let me check, NumSoup agent, I think was 15 or 16 or something. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but only, 16 agent is has phase one and the other other all have phase zero i come to that later then i search my kernel and set up all the necessary stuff that needs to be known by the sh compute shader so we just define like um, speed force and delta time and i give these values back to the compute shader Ah, wait. And just, yeah, the struct is the same. Um, we have here again our agents, our kernel, it's fireworks. So if we go down, 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 here's fireworks. We have our um, kernel function. We have our agent buffer, the num agents, sub agents, force, max speed, random. I don't think I use it. Um, because I have the random function here. I have written a limit position. So if I, I know if I'm going outside the screen that the, that the, the particles don't leave the screen space or don't overwrite, or don't write to a position that's not, not legal, so to say. And this is like the draw position because um, the positions are between zero and one, this is just like multiplying it by the resolution minus one. So if I have a texture from zero, uh, like if I have a texture from uh, 512 pixels wide, um, I need to be maximum 511. So that's why resolution, resolution minus one. 
then I ran th through the agents. Um, as I said, I have a, a face. That's the new thing in the agents, the face, <clears throat> which is more or less um, a distinct, yeah, this distinguish the agent if it's like, if it's in phase two, um, it's just um, an exploding particle. So it doesn't to have much to do except decelerate and blend to black. Um, phase zero is an agent that's dormant, so it does nothing. So if you go back to the to the initial program, which means every sixth and sixteenth agent is an active one, and all others are sleeping. That's also why you don't see like if I go here, I have eight agent and fifteen sub agents. Um, that's why you see only eight agents at the at the beginning, and then everyone can generate 15 sub agents. Why 15? I will come to that in a minute. Um, so for phase one, I check um, if the velocity is dropping below 0 0.2, which means like it's more or less on the peak. The firework is at its as it peak. I let it explode. Um, so I run from one to num, num sub agents. Um, create a new uh, create a new set set the values for the for the agent um, at this ID, which is like the ID of my agent plus its sub agent. So yeah, I hope I hope you can follow me. So I have like on position zero. And then following from one to six uh, to fifteen, my sub agent, and at sixteen, uh, uh, the the next main agent starts. So I know I can write <clears throat> subsequently the exploding um, particles, and they all get phase two. Uh, so I know it's a particle later here, as, and and for the current main agent, I give it a new position on the bottom a new velocity and the, the game starts over again. And of course, I have to write back the values to the to the buffer. Um, and that's more or, less, more or less the whole program. I then draw the color of the agent on the on the screen. Um, as I said, why why this 15? Um, if I go here and increase <clears throat> the number of sub agents, agents you will see that nothing much happens or that sometimes maybe you get some awkward behavior that something is missing <clears throat> um, in principle we have this the number of threads that are possible per group um, so all the memory in an, in a group is shared and if you go beyond a group um, I can I can restrict the group so the number of threads should be visible, maybe more visible. So let's say we have only four threads per group, and I'll keep that to fifteen. It's still working. Okay, when I developed it, it was not working that well. Interesting. Um, so in theory. You cannot write to agents that are not belonging to your group or to to the to um, to the buffer because the memory is once copied into your group, and if you write into into an ID beyond your group, it's not it's not going to be to come to the output. Why it's now working? I'm surprised, <laughs> but yeah, maybe maybe you find yourself in such such a situation um, and then you know where it comes from this is a more um, advanced simulation um, i don't know if anybody of you know boyds it was created back in the mid of the 80s um, and i should um, can you see my screen Yes. 
I hope you are still all here. <laughs> so this is like group behavior or, or, or swarm behavior. Um, like you, the, the behavior that you're experiencing is not because somebody is leading the group, but everybody in, in his like field around him senses the other particles and then behaves accordingly. So we have more or less uh, three main things that we can steer the group with. The one is called separation is like um, birds or whatever you want to call them, um, try to avoid the others. So they want to stay away in a quite a distance from the others. Um, cohesion is like they want to group. So more or less they want to have a common position um, if they experience some neighbors. And the, the alignment is like they want to have more or less um, the same speed as the other um, or as, as their surrounding um, neighbors. So if I Google Boyds, you get a nice article on Wikipedia and also like dimension of Craig Reynolds. I, was, I think, that, yeah, Craig Reynolds presented it in 1987 on SIGGRAPH. So separation means like you have you have a bird because Boyd's was like, so the idea they want to, to simulate bird flocks. Um, you want not have too much uh, people in your in your circle or you 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 want to avoid them alignment is like you want to have more or less the same speed or uh, direction um, velocity direction of of your neighbors and cohesion is you want to clump more together um, i wanted to make some some slides and then i found something nice about points um, from ben eacher he has a nice website. Um, where you can play around. Um, he also has a GitHub um, with his code. I would be have happy if I had his code because I, the code I looked up was a little, little bit, um, yeah, not quite understandable. So. If you go through the example, I encourage you to maybe take his code and replace the one that's here. Um, and the last one is quite, um, yeah, a simple simple fire solution uh, simulation in terms of simple because it just uses some agents and um, and blurring of the of the texture so ah didn't i go no i didn't go to sorry i did just the visual stuff so <laughs> voids um the void has a position, a velocity, and uh, an acceleration. Um, these are like the, the functions I spoke of, like align, alignment, cohesion, and separation. Um, as I mentioned, the values calculated here are quite not 100% correct for me. It was not quite understandable why something has to be dis um, um, subtra subtracted. I think the, the code from Ben Eater is much more understandable. Um, so I just calculate the, the three values from alignment, cohesion, and separation to get my new acceleration and, and position values and velocity values. Um, and obstacle is a function like for the walls so that the, the boards don't collide with the wall. And in the end, um, with these new um, calculated values, I, I gave a new acceleration and a new velocity to the voids. And then 
on the target position I render the the point. Um, and I had here something. Let me check. Sorry, back to the voids. It should, in theory, no. nearly zero. I wrote this one to show me how much. Um, influence comes from these three uh, um, because in every in every of this function the, the set coordinate gives me the number of voids that are in vicinity and I'm a little bit confused why I don't see any colors here, except green. Which means, ah, because I have maybe the range here. Okay. Don't code. I think I know what I have done. No. Radius. I think if I reduce, now I've broke. Uh, no, no, I've broken something. It's still showing compiling on the bottom. Now it's finished. Yeah, thank you. It doesn't, yeah, whatever. So if I make the radii smaller, it should show some effects. No. Yeah, I wrote this a while ago, so sorry for that. I want, wanted to, to show you something, um, but it seems not to work. But anyhow, I hope you get the idea. So um, this was like to check how much um, neighbors are influencing my my current or the boy's current um, behavior. Ah, no, oh, I saw some colors. Yeah, whatever. Um, I will share. I will share anyhow today the GitHub repository with you, where you only have the part one inside, but part two I will release in, in next week. Um, so yeah, the last one was was a more or less a small fire simulation, kind of. Um, which has like fire particles, which has position, velocity, acceleration, and the color. Um, and from the new thing here was like that I have more kernels, I think. Yeah. So we have a convolution kernel, which makes like this the, the blurry blurring effect. Um, we have a kernel for updating the particles. And we have a kernel for, for drawing. So in principle, um, you see here the different kernels. Convolution is just a simple box filter um, and gives back. It, so it reads from the source, it, um, makes makes uh, adds up all the colors from the source, and then puts it back into into the targets. Um, 
by, by first of all, um, a box filter and then um, with a special texture, which you see maybe when I run, run play. So this red thingy in the background is a, is a texture that's decreasing um, the values, which is, I have to look it up now. I don't know if I have the fire simulation. No, I have to see where I have. I will. I will put the link into the code. Um, what this mean and and how it how it should enhance like the the simulation effect of fire. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, without it, it's yeah, maybe not different. So it it doesn't doesn't get decreased anywhere. Um, so, but what's interesting is that we can, as you see, can define more, more kernels in in a in a compute shader. Which means, like, you have more or less more uh, main functions to to be able to jump in, but keep like structures and and stuff like that, um, so you don't have to rewrite them um, in in the same program. Um, so we were on convolution particle update is just uh, um, what the particle should do. So if I Disable here some code. And hope it's compiling and working. I can make different effects with the particles, so the dancing less. Uh, this is a shape function, so they have follow a shape. Yeah, and you can do some fancy stuff with it. Um, let me just give back the decrease functionality because in this scenario, you see it better. So in the background runs runs a texture that's decreasing like the value. So you get a little bit between yellow and red values. Um, so let's make it not too complicated. This is just like um, defining a shape for the position of the particles. Um, these are like just particles with velocity running around and um, particle draw is um, our particles calculating the position of the particles and then write something into the target render texture. So from the setup point of view, since we have different convolution, uh, different kernels, um, we also have to say for each kernel which um, variables he needs to see. So as you see, I have the particle buffer created, but I need it not only in the update, but also in draw. So uh, the shader program gets for the kernel draw also the particle field, uh, particle uh, particle particle buffered visible. Um, this is like setting the resolution. This time we set ints instead of setting a vector. But be careful um, if you do something like that, you can add as many um, parameters as you want. But it just stupidly ran, uh, copies the stuff in memory. So if you run out here um, of memory or you don't have enough variables or you after, like if I put a, a third integer here, sorry, hit the wrong key. If I hit, if a third integer here, it would overspill in Y line, for example. So be careful with that. Um, this is how many particles we have. And for convolution, we have to set the texture. 
and the main program is like switching now between source and render targets um, to wait the, the update is here um, switching between source and render targets um, because we run like the, we we draw our our agents make the convolution, write the, the, the result into the, copy the result into the target texture, and then swap the two rendered pixels in the, in the first one and make the convolution and, and um, then copy the convolution back to, to the second texture. Um, which is, like you see here, like um, we first dispatch the particle update, then we make the convolution, um, set the source. I don't know why I don't have to set the source target. Ah, target is already set. Um, yeah. Let me check convolution needs a source and a target. We set the target for convolution. If I swap this. Ah, yeah, I, I know because I do this trick like target is already set from from the time before so i come in with for example toggle zero source source gets to render texture zero then render target is render texture one and if i go over um source would be render texture one and i only have to to no um, and then, then I have to set the target to render texture one. So this is basically um, swapping like like a double buffer, um, making the convolution. Um, what I'm missing is a, no, I don't need a copy function because target takes from source and I swap every time. Yeah. Hope, hope this was understandable. I was confused for a second. Um, any questions so far? Since I don't, maybe ah, now I see you. Um, and as a last one, I think this is the, the most impressive one. This is called diffusion limited aggregation. Um, and I hit to have, I have to hit it twice. Um, this is like simulating particles in a, an electric field, so to say, and then they stack together, clump together, and and build nice structures. Um, what changed now is like. I can say how many simulation steps are done during one update. So if, if I set it to one, the, the simulation runs very slow. And if I set it to 100, so I make now 100 simulations before I draw the, tech, uh, the render texture on, on screen. So which gives a quite fast result. And from code, This is like super old code from, I don't know, ages ago. Um, but it, it renders nice pictures. Um, and yeah, maybe I started out with, let me check, yeah, I can set it to one. I oh, no. I limit it to 0 0.5, good. Um, So let me just check this here so I can set it to one. 
So I made it the first version was very quickly. So if if a particle finds a seed, which is like a laid down particle, um, then it sticks to it. But as you can see, first of all, it looks not that nice. Um, maybe I have to reduce the number of particles here too. Let's show every simulation 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 step. So the particles start randomly somewhere and running around, and they are faintly visible. So let's make it a little bit quicker. So the, the first particle accumulates, then the second, and so forth. And I reduced the resolution a little bit, so it's more. So like these particles are attracted to the center, and as soon as they found an already placed particle, they, they st stuck on it. They get stuck. But this didn't gave me the, the results I was used to it. So uh, and this there comes this aggregation increments into play, which means like a particle can accumulate um, to a place um, as soon as a particle was laid down, but it just contributes a little bit to this uh, pixel. And the more they accumulate, the higher the, the value on, on a specific location gets. And then you get like this um, nice spread out um, thingy. So it takes not much longer for a pixel until it's fully like, how do you say? Um, um, it's like until enough deposit is, is laid down there and um, only then can the structure grow. And if I give it now, again, a lot of particles, it will grow much faster. Yeah, and you can play around. If the thing has no force, then the particles are super random. Um, but since the random function of, first of all, this is, this is kind of a shortcut that they get attracted to, to the center of the deposit. And um, secondly, the random generator is not that good as you can see that it really is random. And this is, and I hope I can um, simulate that. So I have like here for the particle position, I calculate an when I have to calculate this cosine, I have to subtract subtract some magic number because um, from the from from the random function, I don't get super randomness, and this is like counterweighting that that stuff. Um, let me check if I. Is find so particle move. So if there have this other magic number, if I remove the magic number, um, and don't go to one particle and run. Okay. It's out of screen. Why? Oh, it's blocking my thing. So disable the force, and as you can see. 
the random generator uh, does not play well with the cosine function and the, the particles tend have a tendency to go up instead of just staying like random if it would be pu purely random they should be on average keeping the position they started from which is as you can see not the case so i have some magic numbers to counteract that um and i don't know if you're interested in dla you can you can um, look it up how it works um so a quick quick tour through it i go through all my particles um then i see like that there i calculate uh, a random direction i want to go to um take the force into account so it gets attracted to the center um and i don't know why i've disabled x here let's just check Ooh. Mismatching kernel, why? Ah, unsigned, okay. Hmm. Yeah, so um, I go over over time or with a, with a delta, delta time, I calculate in the direction in X and Y with sine and cosine and um, subtract the force. Then I write, I read, uh, write the particle back to its buffer. So it's available for the, for the next round. Um, then draw a color. So we see, see this green little spot where the particle is and then comes the interesting part so it searches its neighbor in a nine by nine uh, in a nine box or so three by three grid and sums up how many stuff is already aggregated at this given pixel and it sticks to the position that is if the sum is greater than one or if the aggregation I'm currently on is greater than zero. So if I if my neighbors don't meet the the, the threshold of one, um, I still have a chance to deposit to deposit myself if I'm on a place where already something was deposited. Um, if I stick, um, I I do a little increment to the aggregation um, texture and then draw my draw my color yeah and if i was stuck i just get a new random uh, position so this calculating some stuff for, for a new position um, if i'm stuck or i'm out of bounds if i'm if i got Stuck or I'm out of bounds, I, I calculate a new position. Um, oh yeah, I know what this is. This is like um, if I deposit myself, so if I got stuck, I just search if in settings the radius where my starting position will be for the next round. Um, should be okay in set new position. I give the whole settings structure to it. Um, so I extend the radius as uh, when my when my structure grows. Um, and the most interesting thing is I have two structs here. One are the settings, which is just a, uh, a, a struct with one entity, and the particles with all, all which which has all the positions. So with settings um, i can define um, the radius where the where new particles are spawned so to say so if i start 10 is maybe too too little bigger. so this is initial seed from c sharp which is more like donut shaped um, but as soon as a particle um, 
get stuck, you see around here, this peri pyramid, at, at this radius, the new particles are spawned. And the more the structure grows, the, the wider gets the radius away from, from the structure, uh, from the deposits. And programmatically, so I have these two structs. Um, settings was just like to show you that you don't need to define like single numbers um, or single variables. You also can have like one one global struct that holds more information. But it's yeah, I don't know harder to set up because you have to to make an array with one um, a, uh, element and then create a buffer for it and set it for the for the for the shader for the compute shader same goes for the particles but with particles we are already familiar um, and in the end we have our update function and there we check um how many simulations we want per update and that many times we call the dispatch function so it gets simulated more often than it gets drawn um and that's more or less it so um yeah two things we have two kernels one is the particle update which is more or less how the particles move but it this is just a simulation step without, um, no, with, uh, the other one was in it, uh, I know, I know. Init aggregation is like setting for the first, um, setting the first seed um, of the, um, setting the first seed in the center of the, of the or the defined center um, in the aggregation um texture so that that there is a, a seed the particles can stick to but this should be called only yeah this is called only on um, init aggregation is only dispatched here in init aggregation texture so if I had the reset R for reset or in start, um, I made this initial step. Um, the setup is like some some defining some colors, the settings, then the the positions around the radius, and as you can see, I vary the radius between half and one, so I get this like. I don't know how, how this called in, in English, like a 2D donut shape kind of structure. Um, then I create the buffers for the settings and for the particles. Um, and for the particle, uh, for the settings, we have to do it twice, I think, because we also need it in the init step. Yeah, so um, that both kernels can see the, the settings buffer, I have to call it twice. So once, once for the up particle update, so the particles can see the settings and once for the initial setup, so the init function can see the, um, the setting structure, which like in, in init, as I said, just um, takes the center from the settings and draws at that position the first seed and and makes the first sets the first color in the in the color texture. Yeah, that was uh, my talk about agents and compute shader. With that, I will stop sharing my screen and. I hope you didn't fall asleep <laughs> during my talk. Thank you very much, Gottfried. I think I think it's super interesting. Sorry, this was a cat stampede. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I hope your cat is not tearing down no, your no, kitchen. No, no. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks for the. For... So, as promised, wait, 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 wait for it. So, I copy the repository into the chat so you can have, like, for from the last session. Um, a sneak preview and I think mid or end of next week I will I will push the, the stuff from today on the GitHub but I will announce it anyhow on, on meetup then and then you can play around think around maybe extend it improve it <laughs> whatever <laughs> Cool, thanks a lot. And this is also maybe a good reminder. I forgot to share also the link to the, the Google Drive links with the slides and the code from Joseph Hawking. So AR in I think we can stop recording too. Shall I stop recording? Shall we record the questions as well? Oh, or? Yeah, Q, Q and A. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I think it was super interesting. Um, I hope uh, not too many people thought it's too overwhelming, but it's maybe uh, also nice to, to have a bit of an idea what computers are about and what you can do with it, uh, even if you didn't follow along every piece of the code. Yeah, I think from the code, you, you, can, you can go then to GitHub and, and make it yeah. look because it makes no sense to, to talk about the code. It's more about the shader and how, how you set up the compute shader, mm. how the kernels work to, together. Um, so so the most interesting part is like if you have more than one kernel in one compute shader and you want to, to share like the particles or the textures, you have to, to say it twice because, because every kernel needs to know. So like whether um, I share again my screen um you have on the one side global variables for example um where is it resolution so resolution is an in that sense a global variable you just have to say um or to to expose it to the compute shader there is um render uh, there's textures and buffers are only seen by the kernels so you have to say every kernel that wants to to access the, the buffer or the texture um so for color for example uh my color is doing, yeah, doesn't matter so i need to set the texture for every kernel so that every kernel sees the texture so this is a little bit different difference between if I have a global variable versus versus a structure buffer or or a render texture defined. And this this was more like the focus on that. Also it got a little bit maybe too too big with all the different things, but um like just having prime law lines drawn would be a little bit underwhelming and and each each um each example puts a little bit another perspective on how you can use um render targets and and combine them and blur them or how you can use the different um agents and create new agents and stuff like that so what you can't do, you have to always think you can only have a fixed array and then work with that. And if like in the fireworks example, you cannot spawn like, and now I want 16 more of, 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 um, of agents. So you have to be a little bit creative, let, mark them as dormant and then reuse them like classic pooling. <laughs> Lucas, you're on mute if you wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's also the append buffer. Yeah. But uh, you still have, like, it's it's just a, um, a still a fixed size 
array yeah. that you work with, uh, but you have some tools that give you the size of the array in a separate buffer and you can ab append to the buffer. That's why it's called append buffer. Yeah. So you can just add stuff and the, the size increases that, and then you can work with it like with a dynamic list, but yeah. still in the background, it's just a static yeah, array. So, so it's a it's it's a more convenient pooling. So, so a classical pooling where you don't care about you know you have maybe ten thousand objects and if the pool is full, the pool is full. But un, until that time, you can you can dynamically without the hex I did, yeah. And I, I saw for me what this, it was experienced like without slides as if it's um, yeah. If you developed the code one month ago and then you, you try to present it without slides, is a little tricky. But I hope it was not too confusing. It for sure um, is a good idea to check out the GitHub repo once you updated it um, and play around with it yourself. Are there are there any other questions? I have comments. <laughs> Please welcome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, one thing is that the, the threads is uh, always a minimum of 64. Maybe you said it in the first part, but if you use less threads than, so if you have yeah, this right eight by there. eight yeah. by one, which yeah. is the default, it sums up to 64 because yeah. it's eight by eight by one. Yeah. And uh, if you have less than that, you can have less than that. But in the background, the GPU still uses all of them and runs the code on all of them, exactly, but yeah. discards everything that, yeah. uh, that, that you don't use them. Um, that's one thing. And then uh, with the, you, you have a lot of ifs and for loops in there. Nasty, I know. <laughs> it's, uh, if I understood it correctly, it's, uh, well, the, the GPU like makes a patch of, of, of tasks or of, of these programs. And uh, every time you have an if, all of them stop until uh, the, the code, for, which is different for them, yeah. is uh, in sync again. Yeah. So uh, if you can avoid an if or in for loop, uh, with for loops, there's one other thing that I will mention in a second, but uh, normally it just stops all that are not executing the if, and to start up again, it, it waits until all are at the same point again. And that takes always a bit of extra time. So if you have a really complex compute shader, you're actually losing performance yeah. that way. Uh, but it's, if, but it depends on what you're doing, if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw actually really complex compute shaders where you had a performance hit because of it. So, and with the for loop, um, there is actually it. If you can have a fixed okay. amou amount of of runs, mm -hmm. not a dynamic one, and then you can actually use an attribute. So in the square brackets, mm -hmm. uh, which is unroll, and what it does, it's just the writing help. So what it when you the shader is compiling it just writes the same lines uh, the amount of times that the for loop runs and uh it so so it's actually like just uh, ex, uh um, yeah unrolling we write every unrolling yeah, rewrite yeah. Every line with, with the variable sets in the for loop yeah, yeah exactly and uh so that is just a helper to to write the the for loop uh, in a in in a more performant way if it has a fixed size, and uh, you gain performance from it. If it is variable size, then you can use it, of course. And if you want to force it um, to to be not unrolled by default, because sometimes they are uh, unrolled by default. Mm -hmm. Then there's also an attribute, I think it was loop, but I'm not completely sure about that. Uh, and then it's not at all, not ever unrolled. So 
that's also good to know and can cause a lot of problems if you not, don't know about this behavior. Um, because if it automatically unrolls, it, you always have the same amount of, of executions. And then you change the number of how many times you want to execute it in code. And it doesn't change because it was compiled into the shader. Um, and did I, did I write just anything else? Um, no, I, that, that's it, basically. <laughs> the comments I had. <laughs> Thanks, Lucas. I think, I think this is, I mean, um, this is also worth mentioning for shaders in general, not only for compute shaders. Yeah. So this, this also applies for shaders. I didn't mention it, and thank you that you that you brought it up. Um, yeah, it's because... it's a lot of uh, like like things where you the first time you experience problems from it, you're like completely confused and confused, and it's hard to find resources about it. Yeah. Uh, it's like if you even if you search the the the, the forums uh, of unity it's it's like if i i searched for 20 times and the last time i found finally found an answer to it where someone super technical explained what is happening on the hardware and yeah. i i was like uh, i understand stand half of it it's super interesting uh but but now i i know why i have to to avoid certain things uh, ah, and one super interesting thing is also you can use uh, HLL, uh, HLSL include files also in compute traders, and you can even share them, have the same ones in a, uh, in a uh, shader and in a compute trader. That's also super cool. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Gottfried. I would also have a question. So I, I really liked how you, to me, it looked like you display, you, you demonstrated two different use cases. Um, one was more like um, computed image effects and the other one um, like yeah, simulation of, of agents, which maybe can also be considered for computer games as enemies or something like this. Um, do you think is are these the two main use cases for compute shaders or are there I, I would not more? say that compute shader are are have a specific use main use case. Um, I think it's a nice a nice thing you can do with compute shaders. And for example, as you said, like this could be enemies. Um, then you can get rid of this all render texture stuff because you would just would run the, the struct with the simulation on it. Um, the render texture is more or less for us to see something at the end. Um, so yeah, it could it could for sure um, boost your performance uh, if you have nice code that runs on the GPU. But but that's always like as as we started with with uh, part one, um, mm. compute shaders are more or less general programming on the GPU. So so mm. running code you normally run on the CPU, but faster and 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 and, and quicker. So um, I don't have my slides here. I'm sorry. Um, no worries. I I had this this GIF animated with a cannon that shoots a smiley, and then you saw from the MythBusters <laughs> where they built like a parallel computing uh, for NVIDIA demo. Like and when NVIDIA I think uh, released CUDA to the world, and they throw like. 64 by 64 uh, paintballs at the same time at, at the one image. So that, that's the difference between the CPU and the GPU, I would say. Um, also, like CPUs have now eight cores, but still it's uh, still not that much as you have on the GPU. So yeah, it could be, I think, I mean, the reasons, uh, the reasons, the, the, the use cases are like either you go for, for visuals, then you would go like using it with render textures and in render passes and, and make enhancements um, like post-processing stuff or that. Or you go like more in the simulation pass and then you you work more with structs and, and code and then you have nasty ifs and loops and stuff like that. And then you have to think like Lucas mentioned uh, and on performance because because the, the GPU is not like that same, um, has not like the same um 
execution mode like uh, CPU has, so, so it stalls on ifs. Um, I think the earliest implementation was that so both paths of the ifs were executed and only one was discarded and then you got the result. So do you have to keep that, that in mind? It depends on, on which GPU you maybe also are developing, what, what happens with the if. Yeah, it's it's uh, hardware dependent, but I think it's on modern hardware it just yeah, it's stops exactly. the execution. Yeah, exactly. But but still, you have this like as you said, you have this stall, and yeah. until until the longest path is executed, nothing else happens, um, which is which is okay because you want to run a program in parallel, and in the end, um, you want the results on sixty four threads combined. Um, on 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 a struct yeah. written out, so so it makes sense that you stall everything. I, I would I would say um, it using compute traders uh, makes sense. Always when you have a lot of objects where you or a lot of uh, data where you have to use the same operations on, yeah, then then it's perfect uh, and you get the most out of it. But as soon as they get a very different. Then it's probably better to use it use the CPU and maybe multi-threading or stuff like that. Um, I mean, sometimes it's it, it it's it's if you only have like a slight difference uh, between them, it still can be faster on the GPU. But and uh, also a big difference that still sometimes people don't don't know is like the GPU doesn't calculate as precise. It has uh, like a, a less precision in, in the calculations, and that's also one part of what makes it faster. Um, and uh, it, it gets more precise. I mean, you can with modern GPUs, you can even use double as a mm -hmm. as a data structure. It ha doesn't have full support, and and I think there's some malfunctions that that don't work with with double, but it. So, so technically, it's still there, but then it gets as slow as as doing it on the CPU. And why would you do that? <laughs> we probably could go on uh, the, uh, with the discussion the whole evening. Maybe let's have a look. Is there one one last question you were not able to ask yet about compute shaders? I don't have a question, but I also wanted to say Garfield that was awesome. Uh, it was mind blowing and there was a lot of witchcraft involved. <laughs> but it was really cool uh, to yeah. to have uh, such a different uh, kind of topic where we used to have also in the in the meetup. I think, you know, sometimes the, uh, you have to just step back and see the different applications because the ends every different elements that we have is just an extra tool that we can use uh, and in this case things like simulations and stuff like that is, is really cool that we can do all these flock uh, behaviors and that's, that stuff is really cool. Um, yeah, I will have to check the, <laughs> the git because <laughs> really it was, and, and when you go to, of course, when you get to code and specific stuff, if you don't have the background with shaders, it's yeah. hard to follow. Yeah. Um, but the the main the main idea uh, it was easy to to get um, yeah I really think that the the way you play it man. I think the obvious question is uh, will there be a part three? I just talked with Lucas. <laughs> Maybe we should work on part three. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for sure, there, there's still like um, how, how I read back to the CPU and how can I use it then and stuff like that. So like thinking now of the board simulated on the GPU, but you want to to um, move around game of objects or something like that. So we still can extend it if, if and we can maybe ask the, 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 the meetup if we should continue with compute traders or not. Um, did you create examples just for the um, just for the for the uh, talk or or in some other? No, this was for the talk. I mean, the, the boards and the DLA. I wanted to do a long time ago on compute shaders, <laughs> and now finally, thanks to the talk, I had time for that. Okay. And the rest was like, yeah, what what can I give away for for like the fireworks? Was like, yeah, it's, New Year's is coming, so. <laughs> okay. 
Awesome. Like just like, how would you program old school with a fixed array um, a spawning technique? Let's say, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And thanks it's for a, mentioning the append buffer. Yeah, but that's definitely a thing. It. I. I also was fighting a lot. Uh, with with you, you have like this programming patterns that are super good uh, on the on the CPU, but then you try to implement it on the GPU and it's really? not possible or or super hard. And it, sometimes I like one of them was the um, spatial partitioning. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have like like just. Um, to speed up uh, the calculation, which are the nearest objects, for example, with the, the void, which are the nearest neighbors, yeah. uh, you can use spatial partitioning, which is just yeah, exactly. uh, like drawing a grid on the, the whole thing. And only the ones that are in the same area are checked if the distance is. <laughs> exactly. At the moment, it's an n square um, yeah. algorithm. And super and, stupid, and for sure, with space partitioning, you can make it much smarter and faster. But um, getting that on the GPU is not easy. <laughs> not easy, um, but I will try. <laughs> Maybe then the is a computer data free. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Okay, so let's let's end now the official part.